Here's the season now, to only watch movies set on cold winters about a bunch of jerks running around buying presents and learning basic human empathy. Yeah, I tend to stick with childhood favourites for my viewing fix around Christmas. But what if you want to watch something Christmas related, but you don't want to watch a full movie, and you still want to see your favourite cartoon characters doing generic Christmas special things? ABC had you covered in the late 2000s, and I welcome you to the showdown. On this 12th brand new showdown, I shall send to you a comparison between Shrek the Halls from 2007 and Merry Madagascar from 2009. Both are Christmas specials made by DreamWorks about characters from their famous movie franchises learning the meaning of the holidays. With DreamWorks, you never know if you're going to get something good. I'm not due for dedicated movie reviews for a while yet, but to get my thoughts on the Shrek movies out of the way, I'm a snob for the first one with its more rebellious mission statement and comparatively chill tone. So I wasn't looking forward to revisiting Shrek the Halls, doomed to be the most cliched, inoffensive story to ever have those green antennae slapped on its logo. There, that's better. That isn't the cliched part, as far as I'm aware. Shrek's taking care of his kids and relaxing in the summer heat when Donkey comes around to alert him that there's only 159 days left until Christmas, leading Shrek to say something I'm sure they wanted to be a gasper. Now go on. I don't care about Christmas. <gasps> he doesn't care about Christmas in this Christmas special? The months go by and Donkey continues pestering Shrek about Christmas until December 23rd. Fiona comes out of the hut with the babies to look at the snow, saying it'll be their first Christmas as a family. Okay, so the ogre babies are at least five months old now, and I'm going to assume ogre pregnancy is about as long as human pregnancy, and already the specials lost me. It's heavily implied this is Shrek's first time celebrating Christmas too, so putting aside the possibility that Fiona could have introduced it to him sometime here, or across the estate at Far Far Away, having the story at this point in the franchise doesn't make sense. I take my Shrek timelines very seriously, okay? Shrek now has expectations to live up to, has said no one since 2007, and heads into town to get a hint on what to do. This store lady is scared for her life since Christmas Eve shopping's right around the corner, but she's kind enough to lend Shrek this massive book that explains the five things he needs to do to celebrate Christmas. Shrek and Fiona get the hut decorated for Christmas with junk and animals laying around the swamp. It's a fine enough montage with a gross Shrek spin, no issues here. But Fiona has Donkey convinced that Shrek wants a close-knit family Christmas, so what does he do while Shrek has his Christmas checklist almost complete? Merry Christmas, Shrek! Oh, not you! Comes over and invites all his friends because they're family too. I don't feel very good. Please. Oh, I feel better now. Mom, I couldn't. Don't stop believing. This special is why work Christmas parties are a thing. Shrek's unable to finish his reading of the night before Christmas, but Donkey, Puss in Boots, and Gingy all have their own takes on it. Donkey's has a cursed DVD menu. A roast turkey that dances to CC Music Factory. And a giant waffle Santa. It's nice, colorful, and I like this joke. Donkey! Santa? Donkey! Santa! Donkey! Oh! This is his more modest, just a Spanish take on Santa Claus. It's cut short when he goes cute. It's also pretty nice. Then, oh god, Gingies! He recounts the story of when his girlfriend was eaten by Santa. Gingy law is deep, guys. And as if things couldn't get faster and zanier, the party's ruined when Shrek and Donkey fight over the book, setting off a chain of events that leads to fiery chaos, a boiling tea gag, and Shrek throwing out all of the uninvited guests. Fiona's heading out too then, disappointed that Shrek doesn't get the true meaning of Christmas. I mean our Christmas, for you and the babies. Christmas is not just about you or me, or even the babies. This is when I realized there's a Jesus in the Shrek universe. Shrek catches up to them and apologizes for his behavior, explaining that ogres don't celebrate anything, 
Donkey's kind of let off the hook for making his friend's Christmas more frustrating, but it's okay, as Shrek has learned to share his own piece of the Christmas pavlova, even offering his own unique rendition of the night before Christmas. Hey, how's it going? With that, the holiday is saved, and Santa flies by to add Ogre Antennae to the moon. I hope you like this visual because the credits go on for seven minutes. I get it's a holiday special made by a high-end animation studio, but did these really need to take up a quarter of the running time? Shrek the Halls is a mixed bag. The animation's pretty good, filled with easter eggs, deep character study, and look at that! Dragon's doing the Snoopy dance, that's wonderful! But the sets can sometimes look a little lower quality than what you're used to from the movies. Wow, did they film this in an actual forest? I can't tell. Most of the fairy tale creatures get their time to shine, and the main characters are less mature than in the movies, but it's what they learn that counts. Mike Myers, Cameron Diaz, Eddie Murphy, and Antonio Banderas all reprise their roles, and I wouldn't have it any other way. The writing of the story is what deters me from it. Not everything feels like it's set up or resolved properly, and while there's some good jokes here, it's nothing to howl over. For a Shrek Christmas special, it's predictable, but a little amusing here and there. Merry Madagascar was something I had higher hopes for. Their movies were certainly more consistent than Shrek's, and they were always meant to be silly kids movies willing to sell out, not nearly as countercultural as DreamWorks' earlier films. Plus, the story was headed by Ennio Turrison Jr., a former SpongeBob crew member. Stars are lining up for me. It opens with the gang still on Madagascar's shores, dating it to between the first and second movies, and with Mort showing up pissed drunk, my expectations are raised dramatically. Alex, Marty, Gloria, and Melman are celebrating Christmas while still hell-bent on getting back to New York. Their latest plan to get back is by Hot Air Balloon, but they're shot down by King Julian and the Lemurs, who mistook them for the annual Red Knight Goblin that throws coal at them. But when a strange red glow actually does start pelting them with coal, Alex knocks it out of the sky, saving their hinds. Bad move as it appears, as that Red Knight Goblin turns out to be Santa Claus, who's bumped his head and got amnesia now. I don't often say this, but I can't believe Alex the Lion has ruined Christmas. I'd blame Julian too though. He's taken to convincing the lemurs that December is, in actuality, Julianuary, a month all about his kingdom showering him with gifts. It doesn't take long for Santa to curiously observe the festivities, and for me to laugh. I like to... Very nice. You like to... All together. We like to... <laughs> Gotta say though, each butt shake takes 5% off its total score, sorry. This B-plot is decent, I suppose. Santa gets his toy making mojo back without knowing it, and Julian eventually discovers that getting presents didn't feel nearly as good as giving them. <gasps> Look at the smile on Amelia! I've seen funnier and more heartwarming stories, but kudos to them for briefly trying to get King Julian, of all characters, to learn and grow. Weird I'm covering the B-plot first, but it was the biggest surprise to me personally. Back to the main story, with Santa out of commission, it's up to these guys and the Penguins to deliver gifts, and maybe make a permanent stop in New York. But conflict arises when the reindeer won't take them, and the penguins reveal they've feuded in the past. I thought this could have been a reference to their show, but they didn't have a Christmas special until 2010, so I'm stumped. Cupid does fall for Private's handsome looks and dashing personality, and I can see this as a deal breaker for the skip Private shippers out there, but that isn't really important to me. What is important is that the guys are still able to use Santa's magic to ride the sleigh around the globe and deliver the remaining presents. Their first trip goes awry, I mean really awry, I mean really really awry, but they get the hang of it soon enough. Things are going well, and on their stop in Greenland they even discover their own presents. Ah, Dr. Manish's neck massager! But it turns out fuel's running out and they can only do one more trip. Do they go back to New York or Madagascar? Well, this brilliant sequence should do the talking. There she is, fellas. Maybe next Christmas, New York. Now, we have a doozy of an ending on our hands. They make it back and hit Santa, restoring his memory. He heads back to the North Pole with his trusty reserve tank, 
and back in the tropics, Julian wants to get back on the naughty list for some reason, and throws a coconut at Alex. Uh-oh, now he has amnesia. Good night, everybody. They were so close to making something really good, but dropped the ball in a fit of crazy. Largely, I think Mary Madagascar is fine enough. I hadn't watched it before doing this showdown, but I wouldn't mind watching it next Christmas. The animation is good, the story's bloated but entertaining, and while their rendition of Santa is rather uninspired, I think they did enough with the main characters to warrant the special's existence. Sasha Baron Cohen didn't reprise his role as King Julian, unfortunately, but most everyone else is here and accounted for, Ben Stiller, Chris Rock, etc. I know it's weird to bring up the voice actors, but they go a long way in not making these feel like as much of a marketing ploy, but would I consider this special better than Shrek the Halls? Yes, yes I would. Shrek the Halls has its moments, but is just kind of derivative and by the numbers, things that the series mocked back when it started in 2001. This critique is coming from someone who hasn't seen it in a decade. It was part nostalgic joyride, part I can understand why I haven't seen it in 10 years. Mary Madagascar, much like its Big Brother movies, isn't a masterpiece by any means, but it's got a more interesting story with more surprises. Well boys, we did it. This contest is no more. Goodbye for now. Also, if you're asking me where these fit in the timeline, I don't know.